from New York to our TV and radio audiences worldwide. Welcome to Balance of Power, where the world of politics meets the world of business. I'm David Weston. Well, we finally got that deal on oil output production. It was Easter Sunday. It was yesterday, and it went right through the weekend. But our very own Anne Marie Hordern was there at every step of the way reporting on it, <laughs> and I'm delighted to say we welcome her now. So, Anne Marie, I know you had a long weekend here. Explain to us, first of all, what does the deal do as far as we know? Good uh, afternoon, David. Yeah, it was quite a dramatic few days. It, went, uh, it was supposed to be on Thursday, and you thought we were going to get the deal Thursday because we had heard that Russia and Saudi were willing to go to production to their their production to be 8.5 million barrels a day, which is pretty huge, especially when you look at their April figures. Um, but there was a sticking point, and that came with Mexico. It required them to cut 400,000 barrels a day. They wanted to cut at most 100,000 barrels a day. So there was a lot of back and forth throughout the weekend. President Trump had to get involved. And there's been quite a few phone calls between him, Mexico's president, on top of that with him and the king of Saudi Arabia, and President Putin. What the deal does do, though, finally what we got to uh, the deal was 9.7 million barrels of oil. Mexico won this diplomatic uh, victory, really only cutting 100,000 barrels. So if everyone complies, you're looking about this 100 million barrels a day coming off the market. That's if people comply. We have seen in the past, there are some that struggle to comply um, with the likes of Iraq and, and Russia also as well. But when you look a little bit deeper, and Goldman Sachs did some of these numbers, David, if you look at the first quarter of averages of these producers, it could actually be close to about 5 million barrels a day of real oil coming off the market. You'll see a lot of people, like the President of the United States, was talking about 20 million barrels a day. That accounts for other producers declining production, but, but not voluntary, just economically driven declines. This cut is voluntary cuts from these oil producers. Well, what has, has the price of oil done? Because initially, actually, it went up a little bit, but then it went down because people saw the fine print. Now it's back up a bit. What is the market telling us about what they think about this deal? Yeah, the market is basically just saying it's not enough, given the fact we have serious demand destruction. We use about 100 million barrels of oil a day, and right now we're probably working with 65 million barrels of oil a day. So until lockdowns are lifted, people get back to work, um, and you have people flying again, you're not going to really see this massive uptick in demand. And that's why the market is pretty much just shrugging off, off this deal. I mean, David, I can ask you, you're at home. When was the last time you filled up your gas tank? I, last time I took a cab or an Uber, I, ca I can't even remember at this point. This the problem is no one is just using oil. Refineries are having to cut some of the production, and there's nowhere left to really store it. So to answer your question, it's been three weeks now. And by the way, the price of gasoline was, low, it was going down even then when I filled it up. But where does President Trump get the 20 million barrels number from? Because we saw that in a tweet today saying, well, they say it's 10. It's really going to be 20. Where, where does he come up with that number? So there's they're like Azerbaijani minister was talking about the fact that they're including things like Venezuela, like Iran, countries that production has been in free fall as part of these 20 million barrels a day. They're including the economically driven cuts we're going to see from the United States and from Canada, potentially as well, Norway and Brazil. Some of these other countries that are just naturally not going to be producing as much because there's no demand for it. So. That is where a lot of people are throwing around this 20 million barrels a day. But when you're looking at real cuts, voluntary cuts from producers to take barrels off the market, and you're looking at compliance being pretty full at 100%, it's going to be closer to that 9.7 million barrels a day, not the 20 million. Okay, Anne-Marie, thank you so much for that. Great reporting right through the weekend. That's Anne-Marie Hordern. So that's going on with oil. As we say, the price has been bouncing around. It hasn't come up that much. At the same time, equities are off today after a really run-up, big run-up last week after the Fed made their big moves. At the same time, people are now saying, how exactly is that going to work? Is the money going to go into the marketplace fast enough? As we look forward this week to some big developments, including U.S. retail sales, which are expected not to be anything to write home about. And of course, there's big IMF and World Bank meetings meetings coming up later in the week as the world also starts to turn its attentions to emer emerging markets. In the meantime, there's a lot of news going on all around the world, and for that we turn to Ritika Gupta for First Word News. Thanks, David. President Trump says he has the power to reopen the states, not governors. The president tweeted that he will take input from the governors and that a decision would be made soon. 
They'll be making history next month at the U.S. Supreme Court. For the first time, justices will hear arguments by telephone. The coronavirus pandemic has made arguments in the courtroom impractical. Ten cases will be argued. One of them is the fight over subpoenas for President Trump's financial records. China is tightening controls along its border with Russia. China is trying to avoid a new wave of coronavirus infections as people who are sick try to return home to China. Imported infections have become a major threat to rekindling the virus in China after draconian measures managed to reduce local infections to a crawl. Global News, 24 hours a day, on air and on Quick Take by Bloomberg, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. David. Thanks so much, Ritika. Coming up here, we're going to talk with Democratic Congressman David Trone of Maryland about the prospect for yet a fourth round of big spending out of the government to help the economy. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. It's time to get a check on the markets. And for that, we go to Abigail Doolittle. Abigail? Well, David, it is certainly a bit of a risk-off start to the week, but you have to remember last week it was a big rally. Last week, the S&P 500 climbing about 12%. So today we have greater than 1% declines. Last time I checked off of the lows, at the lows uh, down more than 2%, but you can see right now down about 1.4%. And interesting, because last week the NASDAQ, those tech stocks, underperform, perhaps worrisome for the bulls, today on a relative basis outperforming. So can that tech strength uh, bring stocks higher? Interesting, David, if we take a look at two different havens, though, two different messages. The yen is climbing higher, but haven bonds are trading lower. Net nets, lots of uncertainty with stocks down at 1.35% from the highs and then up more than 20%. Investors trying to figure out what is next. Well, what is next is going to be earnings, isn't it, Abigail? Something you and I talk about all the time. We've got bank earnings coming out. That's going to really be big for the markets, isn't it, this week? Uh, definitely. That's the big catalyst that everybody's waiting for. So to your point on banks, reporting tomorrow some of the big banks. And you can see some fairly decent weakness there, even with yields climbing. So that speaks to the degree of uncertainty about what the CEOs of some of the big banks, including JP Morgan, uh, are going to be saying, the color commentary on the macro environment. Uh, most S&P 500 companies have cut guidance, but relative to the banks, uh, lots of folks are looking for higher provisions than expected, commercial loans probably up. And then it'll also be very interesting to see how uh, trading does during this time of uncertainty and so many traders working from home. But it'll be the more macro commentary that could really set the tone for this historic earnings season, David. Investors really want those clues uh, in terms of what's next and directionally for the major averages. Okay, Abigail, thank you so very much. That's Abigail Doolittle with that market check. Well, there seems to be a broad consensus in Washington right now that we need yet a fourth round of spending to try to help the economy out. Not so much of a consensus about exactly how big that's going to be or to whom it's going to go. So we bring in now Representative David Trone, he's Democrat of Maryland, for a read on exactly what the issues are. So welcome, Mr. Congressman. It's great to have you with us. As I understand it, everybody agrees we need more money for small businesses, but beyond that, maybe there's not as much agreement. No, there's no question the small business community needs another $250 billion. The question is, what else needs to be done? And clearly, if you're talking to your hospitals and what's happening in the system, as we can see, the hospitals and community health centers have got to immediately get another infusion. Uh, the Democrats, we've suggested $100 billion uh, to the hospital system and also for state and local governments. Uh, $150 billion is the number we've got in the bill, the supplemental bill. And if you're talking again to them, our governor here in Maryland, Larry Hogan, has done a great job. He's put in a hiring freeze. He's put in a spending freeze. You know, right on top of when he has to hire and process literally hundreds of thousands of more unemployment claims. Now, these are incompatible. So we have to help across the board, local states, Hospitals, medical, and SNAP, 15% increase in SNAP for the children that are out without food. 
So, Congressman, it brings up the question, is this a partisan issue? Because you mentioned your governor, Larry Hogan, who actually joined with Andrew Cuomo, a Democrat, so a Republican and a Democrat, in a statement over the weekend saying, this is really bad for the states. We're going to have to start cutting back essential services. So what is the hang-up? Well, you hit the nail on the head. It's absolutely bipartisan. I mean, you know, our guy, uh, Governor Hogan, a wonderful Republican governor, and Cuomo, a Democrat, working together for 500 billion dollars they say they're going to need. Uh, they've already were given 150 in CARES 1. Our CARES 2 bills another 150. Um, I think it's a pride of authorship, uh, but at the end of the day, everyone's got to come together this week. Uh, the money will run out on the PPP program around Friday. Uh, so the House, Senate came in today, and the House will come in immediately for a voice vote. It's got to be bipartisan. Uh, we got to pull together. Uh, we got to put uh, politics aside. But they know the governors, the local, you know, county executives, etc., need the money. The hospitals need the money, and they need it now. They don't have the PPE that they should have. Just pick up the phone, call your hospitals, and you're going to hear the same story. Yeah, we hear it all across the country. So, Congressman, you said something critical. You said you have to come together. Well, physically, obviously, can't, Congress can't come together. Is that part of the problem here, is that people are doing this on remote, basically the way we're all doing our jobs these days? Well, it certainly slows down the ability uh, to come to a consensus. As a business person all my life, uh, we get in the same room, you talk it out, you walk out, and you march forward to the same vision. Uh, but... Here, that's just physically impossible, and that's going to be that way for perhaps some time. Uh, so it certainly slows down the process, uh, but it's not optional. This has to happen. It has to happen fast, and I'm confident it will happen. So, so Congressman, let's go back to the part that everyone seems to agree on, that $250 billion to sort of top up the, the aid for small businesses. I'm going to draw upon your expertise. You are a small businessman. You founded a small business. You must have a sense of how this is working right now. Are people getting the money? Because I've heard there have been applications for $100 billion of the 350 already appropriated, but it's not clear to me how much that's actually getting out the door and getting into people's bank accounts. Well, a lot of people are absolutely getting the money, but it's not evenly distributed. And our small businesses that didn't have a banking lending relationship. So if you weren't already a, a borrower, you're looked upon as really a second class citizen. And many of our communities and our minority communities, our diversity communities are very underbanked. Uh, when I started my business the first 15 years, I had no lending relationship. Uh, so because I was very risk averse to debt and many of our small businesses are the same way. So they're not getting the money. So in the bill that we put forth, the speaker has the $250 billion, 125 billion of that is the community. Community banks help those in rural areas, very important, uh, but also help those in a lot of our urban towns, urban cities uh, that really aren't getting the money. And you know, we just got to make this happen. The other issue they should do is they should put out guaranteed purchase orders for the PPE. Uh, that's a separate issue, but it's really got to happen. It's just good business. Um, if we use the Defense Production Act to the fullest extent, and I've done supply chain all my life, and we've had a massive supply chain failure. Uh, now with Admiral P in charge, you know, that's where we recommended, many of us did, you know, literally months ago, that put some of the military background that's done supply chain, and he has done a spectacular job, but it's way too late. Uh, he's there now, but he should have been there sooner. Uh, and as a practical matter, uh, uh, how much farther do we have to go? You're on the Joint Economic Committee, as I understand it, for the House. Uh, how much farther do we have to go before we really cushion ourselves from this blow? Well, we've got a ways, uh, quite a ways to go. I don't think this is going to be any magic date where we open the country. It's going to open up uh, when people feel like they individually are ready to open up. It's not somebody makes a decree. That's just baloney. Uh, it's when you and I feel safe and our families feel safe to venture out. That's when we open up, and that'll happen 300 million times. But we've got to get to testing, a massive failure on testing. Then after that, we've got to get to tracing, tracing who's been exposed to those that tested positive, and then we've got to quarantine. So that's got to be uh, what Speaker Pelosi spoke about 
you know, almost three months ago, testing, testing, testing. She was dead on, dead on, and we're still not getting the testing. Uh, without that, you can't trace. Without that, you can't quarantine. And is the Admiral taking on the testing as well? You mentioned the PPE. Is the Admiral taking that on as well? Are you confident that's going to get fixed? A absolutely. Uh, he's been uh, very impressive in the conference calls we've had. Uh, he's the type of person that should have been brought in. Uh, we, want to really, we want to right away rely on our experts, our medical experts like Dr. Fauci and our logistics expert. This is a supply chain logistical challenge. We made upfront logistical mistakes on where we allowed to have these products actually produced. I mean, you can't have all your production in China, and just because it's $2 uh, uh, N95 mass cheaper, that production should have been distributed yeah. across the United States. Maybe we pay $2 more, but yeah. we make it in Wisconsin, we make it in Maryland. Right. That's a much more thoughtful right. way to go. A lot of lessons to be learned, but we hope we've learned it. we're moving forward now. So thank you so much. That's Congressman David Trone, Democrat of Maryland. In the meantime, as we said, the Fed last week really moved boldly on Thursday. And we talked. It's Tom Keene, our colleague, and Mike, Mike, McCle Mike McKee also talked with Vice Chair Richard Clarida earlier today about the state of the U.S. economy. This is what Mr. Clarida had to say. I'm very confident that as the economy recovers from this hit, and began, begins to return and recover, that we at the appropriate time will be able to unwind these uh, programs. You know, Tom and, and Mike, there's nothing fundamentally wrong with the U.S. economy. It came into the year in a very strong position, both in terms of employment and growth and financial markets, and I'm confident we can get back there, and, and at the appropriate time, we can scale back these, these programs. Let me follow up on that, Dr. Clarida, and ask you this. With uh, probably billions of dollars in loans out to companies at near zero for over four years, are you ever going to be able to raise interest rates again, or are we looking at essentially the Fed doing yield curve control now? Well, right now we're not doing yield curve uh, control. What we indicated at, in our March uh, statement uh, is we're going to keep rates uh, where they are, which is basically uh, very close uh, to zero, uh, until the economy is on track to achieve its maximum employment and price stabilities. And so the path of the economy is going to dictate ultimately the path of rates. But in terms of our, our programs, these facilities uh, will be in place during the period when the economy is being impacted by the virus. Uh, in the term sheets for these programs, you'll see uh, that the facilities are due to, uh, to, to uh, stop lending in September of this year. Obviously, we can extend that as needed. Those loans will be in place. They'll have a term of several uh, years. And no, at the appropriate time, uh, I do not think uh, that uh, we will have, uh, that, that will be a challenge to us uh, when it's appropriate. But again, that's a long way down uh, the road. We think where rates are now is where they need uh, to be, given where the economy is. Tom mentioned uh, the notes he's getting from people asking questions, and the one I get most often is, why did you feel it necessary to go into buying junk? Well, we have put in place no fewer than nine uh, facilities uh, over the past uh, several uh, weeks, and, and first and foremost, our, our focus in these facilities um, is making sure that credit is flowing to businesses uh, and households, and <clears throat> obviously we're... we're, we're, we're in the commercial paper market, in the TALF program, we'll be financing uh, auto loans and, uh, and credit cards. Um, in our Main Street lending program, we're going to be partnering with banks to provide financing to businesses. And so the really the vast bulk of these programs is really focused on new lending. There is an element of one of these programs uh, that will uh, that will be purchasing assets in the secondary. Uh, market. I think an important point for your <coughs> listeners and viewers to recognize um, is that several important companies in the U.S. Uh, were investment grade uh, up until this crisis hit. And what we've said in our programs is that, you know, if they've been downgraded after the after the date of the crisis, they will have access to these facilities. But that really is our focus in these programs. Mr. Vice Chairman, the elasticity here, the outcomes of this pandemic are extraordinary. And I'm not asking you to play epidemiologist uh, today unless you'd like to. But no. what I would suggest is we don't know the speed of outcome. 
What do you do if we get a more optimistic outcome? What do you do as an institution if there's a rapidity to our recovery? Well, and obviously, obviously, Tom, we are looking at a very wide range of scenarios, as I'm sure are other central banks and, and policy makers. Uh, and we have gotten a lot of bad news uh, in the last several weeks in terms of the spread of the virus. Um, and the impact, obviously, in the labor market with 16 million initial claims over the last uh, several weeks. So the economy is taking a hit, as I've said, because there's nothing wrong with the economy. We've asked people to step back from economic uh, activity. Uh, there are scenarios uh, that are more optimistic, and, and obviously uh, we, we certainly hope and pray that they materialize. If they do, uh, that will be a good situation to be in. Uh, we will have in place programs right. that are essentially, mm -hmm. Tom, what we're doing is we're building a bridge until the economy can get to the other side and begin to recover. And if that happens sooner, we'll, we'll certainly know what to do at that time. Fed Vice Chair Richard Clarida, and this is Bloomberg. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. It's time now for our Stock of the Hour, and it's Netflix. It's the best performer in the S&P 500 today. And for a report, we turn to Kaylee Lines. Kaylee? David, that's right. At these levels, Netflix is actually set to close at its highest level since all the way back in 2018. And the analyst that really spurred this is Michael Graham. He raised his price target on the stock to $450 a share, and his reasoning is really all about strong subscriber growth. Graham says that growth is going to strengthen because of the increase in demand for in-home entertainment options as everyone is stuck in their houses right now because of the coronavirus pandemic. As a result, Graham says he's raising his estimate for net subscriber additions. He expects that total paid membership will grow 16.5% this year. Previously, he saw growth of just 15.7%. Not only does he think more people are signing up for Netflix, but that there isn't going to be as much churn within its existing subscriber base. And Canaccord isn't the only shop on the street who sees that strong subscriber growth. Our analysts here at Bloomberg Intelligence think Netflix can actually match the 9.6 million subscribers it gained in the first quarter of last year. That would mean the company beats its own guidance by at least 35%. And BI notes that data shows a 56% surge in Netflix app downloads in March. And you can thank the success of the documentary series Tiger King for at least part of that. It's attracted 34 million viewers, David. Okay, thanks so much to Kaylin Lyons. Coming up next, we're going to talk to the Lieutenant Governor of Delaware, herself a health policy expert. That's coming up next on Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. For Bloomberg First Word News, we go now to Ritika Gupta. Thanks, David. The governor of New York is sounding a tone of cautious optimism. Andrew Cuomo said today, quote, the worst is over if we continue to be smart. Still, Cuomo said the coronavirus pandemic will not truly be over until there's a vaccine. That could take 12 to 18 months. New York's death toll topped 10,000 after 671 people died on Sunday. The UK is reporting a slight drop in the number of new coronavirus deaths. Officials say 717 people died in the past 24 hours, down from about 20 from the day before. The UK has had more than 88,000 cases. More than 11,000 have died. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson is out of the hospital, but still too sick to get back to work. He says the doctors who treated him over the past week no doubt saved his life. In Germany, there are signs the infection curve may be flattening. According to data from John Hopkins University, coronavirus cases registered their smallest increase this month. German Chancellor Angela Merkel is scheduled to meet with regional officials on Wednesday to discuss how soon restrictions can be eased. Global News, 24 hours a day, on air and on Quick Take by Bloomberg, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Rishka Gupta. This is Bloomberg, David. Thanks so much, Ritika. Well, the burden of fighting this coronavirus falls very largely on the shoulders of our state officials as they race to try to have social distancing in order to slow down the epidemic so that the health system can catch up. 
Well, Lieutenant Governor of Delaware, she is at Bethany Hall Long, is both a senior state official and a health policy expert, having trained as a nurse and then gone on to get a, a PhD in health policy. And we welcome her now. So, Madam Lieutenant Governor, thank you so much for joining us. Start with the situation in Delaware. How is the coronavirus battle going in your state? Um, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here today. And I have to say, you know, a shout out to all of the state leaders and to our governor, um, Parney, as well in our state. Uh, Delaware, as you know, is a small state, but we reflect the demography of the nation. And right now we have around 1,600 positive diagnosed cases with um, a couple hundred individuals hospitalized and around 35 identified deaths from the coronavirus. And we, of course, are trending a week or two behind uh, the other eastern states, but our governor and others have put into place early on the social distancing executive orders with closing the schools, closing down non-essential business, and I do feel that that has had a great impact. However, like all states, we're worried about what is to come and certainly have been preparing for a surge with different facilities and uh, tent-style hospitals. And what is the situation in the hospitals that you know so well, the doctors and the nurses, the personal protective equipment? Uh, do you think that you're equipped for a surge? Um, in Delaware, uh, you know, again, we have a small system where we have seven hospital systems and then, of course, our Freeland psychiatric facilities and our long-term care facilities. And like all states across the country, you know, we've had to put out appeal for additional PPE. Um, myself, as a professor of nursing, I have to say I have heard from a number of my former students who still practice in the state, uh, as well as others. And uh, we certainly are not in the dire situation of the other institutions statewide and across the country, but we definitely um, have a concern. Um, and so, again, we have PPE. But we also have been counting the ventilators, and certainly our governor and leadership of others have worked really hard to have resources that we need in place. And uh, certainly, you know, that gets into the next phase of my background as a professor in public health and epidemiology, uh, issues around testing and uh, what the future holds with the return to, uh, return to what you would call normal and life, a new normal, right? Uh, Madam Lieutenant Governor, give us a sense of what this is doing to the finances of your state. We had a bipartisan appeal from uh, Governor Hogan, Republican of Maryland, and Governor Cuomo of New York over the weekend, uh, saying basically we need money, we need help here in the states. At the same time, this is being debated basically between Republicans and Democrats on the halls of Congress, at least virtually in the halls of Congress. Where right. is Delaware? Right. And there is a situation time. in terms of costs time for and that. revenues. Uh, as chair elect of the National and Senate Governor Association, I have to tell you, the partisan politics needs to be put aside. Uh, we would not expect a firefighter to enter a home that was burning without fire equipment, uh, without the protective gear. And that's what we in the front lines of health care require as well. We need equipment. We need the sources. And we don't need to, as the other governors have so eloquently stated, be in competition. This is all hands on deck, and we all must be working together. Together. And I know that our governor is working on a regional advisory with Governors Hogan and uh, Murphy and Cuomo and others to really make sure that we're not in competition and how we return to normal. And particularly, how does this affect your revenues? I know, for example, the Delaware Memorial Bridge, I think, is a significant source of revenue for you. With nobody traveling around, it must be hitting Delaware revenues. Well, you know, Delaware like the nation, I mean, absolutely, this is absolutely having an impact upon our economy. And, uh, you know, you can't have a pandemic with also not also having an economic recession or depression across the country. And that is something I know, as I've spoken with my colleagues across the country, you know, we're all very much looking to getting the help. And I know our Senators Coons and Harper and our Congresswoman Lisa Blunt Rochester in Washington have been talking about getting those funds, you know, having the CARE Act, having the funding for our small business, but also, as you indicated, our state with the rollback of uh, taxes and revenues, whether it's toll roads, as you indicated, it does have an impact. And so, fortunately, Delaware has a strong legislature that had put in place a very strong budget, and we had a AAA bond rating, 
having been a member of the legislature, I have to say that has placed us in a better position in some states. But I know our governor and his team are very concerned and certainly are delving deep into planning for the economic impact this has, not only on Delaware, but our region. And finally, Madam Lieutenant Governor, uh, give us your expertise, because you are an expert in this area, about the sort of criteria we should be looking at about bringing back the economy. People are talking about that now. They're talking about getting the number of cases down, having better tracing and tracking. Uh, what would you advise as officials really start to think about how you go about deciding when we can bring parts of the economy back? You know, I think you have to, whether it's the, you know, the economy goes hand in hand. You know, it doesn't do us any good, and you're hearing individuals talk about that, returning persons back to the workplace, back to schools, to just have it research. And there has to be thoughtful data. You know, in the ideal world, we would have started in December and January with, you know, statewide or as much testing as we could in different spots. And I think that is going to be paramount, particularly communities and okay, our thank areas. Thank you so very much. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Okay, thank you so very much. The Lieutenant Governor of Delaware, she's Bethany Hall Long. Coming up next, competition is at the very center of economic policy in the United States, but what happens when you try to organize an oil market globally? We're going to talk with an antitrust expert, Bill Baer of the Brookings Institution. Uh, that, that's coming up next. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. Well, they finally got a deal yesterday, but one of the big contentious issues among oil producers, countries around the globe, was whether the United States would step up to the plate and curtail its own production. Well, the United States ended up predicting it would produce less, but maybe it didn't agree to it. Let's talk to an antitrust expert about whether there is a problem, in fact, with U.S. producers participating, even with government sanction, in an international global agreement. He is Bill Baer. He's former assistant attorney general for antitrust, and he's now with the Brookings Institution. So, Bill, thank you so much for being with us. First of all, let me ask you maybe a tricky question. Did the producers really de facto agree? Because as I understand antitrust law, you don't actually have to get together and sign a contract. If a bunch of competitors sort of say they're going to do something and other people respond to it, can there be a de facto agreement even if they didn't formally raise their right hand to swear to it? Yeah, David, it's good to talk to you. First of all, you can have an agreement without a signed contract or people sitting in a room together. Uh, uh, you can do it by social distance and by uh, a wink and a nod. The real question is uh, antitrust law uh, doesn't apply. Cartel agreements are not subject to challenge by the U.S. government if they're between sovereign nations, which is what it appears this agreement is, OPEC plus the OPEC plus nations entering into an understanding uh, about production cutbacks. So, so, Bill, does that suggest that even if President Trump had done something, we don't, I'm not saying he did this, but actually got together with oil producers, I want you all to agree to this, and then he agreed with the Saudi Arabians and, they, and he agreed with the Russians, that might have been okay under the Sherman Act? I think that's right. Um, there is uh, both, um, there is uh, sovereign immunity that protects nation states that uh, do certain things that otherwise would be violative of the U.S. law from being sued in the U.S. courts. There's also uh, a doctrine called the Act of State Doctrine, which would um, basically prevent the sovereign, in this case, uh, the President of the United States, from being sued for uh, uh, basically managing foreign policy in an economic crisis. How big a change in policy is this, Bill, as a practical matter? As I recall, back in the 70s when OPEC was formed, there was talk about suing OPEC under antitrust laws, and now we've gone around and said we want to agree with them. It's interesting. For the last 20 years, there's been legislation pending in the House and the Senate, and on various occasions, it's passed one chamber or the, the other that would remove sovereign immunity uh, from OPEC. It's called the NOPEC legislation, and it just last month uh, was passed 
I think, unanimously out of the House Judiciary Committee. So there has been a move up until this recent crisis to try and hold OPEC accountable. OPEC is a classic cartel. They restrict uh, output in order to keep prices up, and that harms the average American consumer. But under this doctrine of sovereign immunity, they've been protected up until now. Bill, expand this out a little more broadly, and that is basically the application of U.S. antitrust laws in a crisis, because we have a crisis the likes of which I think it's fair to say we've never seen in this pandemic and basically shutting down the economy. To what extent, if you were back in your old job as Assistant Attorney General for Antitrust, would you take that into account in the enforcement of the antitrust laws? Should we have some play in the joints here and there for this very unusual circumstance? Well, it's interesting. The, my old friends at the FTC and the Antitrust Division, the Justice Department, have done just that. About two weeks ago, they put out some guidance saying, look, if companies want to get together and try and deal with the crisis in a coordinated fashion, come talk to us, explain what you want to do, and we will give you guidance on how to do it without getting into trouble. And indeed, just last weekend, the Justice Department uh, released what they call a business review letter um, uh, to a bunch of uh, wholesalers, drug wholesalers, medical supply wholesalers, who wanted to coordinate with FEMA on how most efficiently to get critically short uh, products uh, to the market. Now, that probably would have been allowed in ordinary times if you were working together with FEMA, the private companies were, but this expedited process gave these drug and medical device wholesalers some confidence that they could coordinate on how to work with FEMA on delivery and avoid being exposed on the antitrust laws. That's a good example of antitrust enforcers responding to a crisis with prompt and effective guidance. And what sorts of things would factor into the decision to say, yes, that one's okay as opposed to that one's not okay? For example, the duration of the agreement. Exactly. The duration of the agreement, uh, really it's necessity. What are they really coordinating? If it's coordinating on, on who's going to deliver what, who's most efficiently to get uh, the product from point A to point B, that's less problematic and, and um, more likely to be approved than saying, and we're all going to set uniform charges on our delivery fees. You know, that, that's basically classic price fixing that likely would get you into trouble, even in a crisis. Fascinating. Bill, in your experience as an uh, attorney, assistant attorney general, did you have anything like this? No. I think during the Obama administration, as the administration was ramping up in light of the 07, 08 fiscal crisis, the Great Recession, there were, there were efforts to uh, be careful about what, Mergers, one challenge. I was not there at the time. Efforts to avoid doing things that would add to the pressure and the uncertainty in the markets. But this is so unprecedented uh, in, in the modern area in, in all respects, including antitrust. One lesson, though, I think we did learn from the Great Recession is be careful about committing to long-term changes in behavior, whether it be mergers or coordination among producers that will outlast this crisis. In a crisis, we need to respond and all of government needs to respond appropriately. But you would not want to allow these drug wholesalers, for example, or airlines or cruise ship companies to merge uh, down from four to three or three to two, because that's going to have a long-term impact on competition and consumers when the markets recover. And the markets will recover. We just don't know how long it's going to take. Yeah, I think that's fair to say. Thank you so much, Bill. It's always a delight to talk to you. It's very informative. That's Bill Baer, now with the Brookings Institution, but formerly Assistant Attorney General for Antitrust. Live from New York, more or less, this is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on Big.
This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. We all are really fixated on this coronavirus and exactly how it works. Earlier today, my colleague Tom Keen got to talk to jo Dr. Joshua Sharfstein. He is vice dean at uh, Johns Hopkins of Public Health. And they asked him about exactly why it is that for some people it seems to take a sharp turn for the worse. I certainly have heard of what you have talked about, that there is a moment um, sort of midway in the illness where uh, some people get quite sick and at that point can even um, proceed to, <clears throat> to death. Um, and that, that's very scary, obviously, for the medical team. It's terrible um, tragedy in every case that it happens. And I think what people are wondering is if, if there is something that can be done to focus on that moment in terms of therapeutics to prevent what may be an overwhelming immune reaction that is leading to that second decline. Help us with the idea of a secondary or reinfection. This is something out of the influenza of 100 years ago. But do you think it's a valid worry for our listeners and our viewers, this idea that there's a virus and then we re-engage with society and we come up again against the same virus a second or even a third time? There's a lot we don't know about this virus, but in general, if somebody who is um, fought the virus off and recovered is unlikely to get that same kind of infection again. I think it would be very unusual for that to be the case. And even the reports of sometimes people may have a coverable virus later are not quite the same as saying people can really get sick twice. So uh, I think that we'll have to see what the data is, but it's probably, um, you know, a reasonable assumption at this point that people who at least were reasonably sick and got better are unlikely to get that sick again. Mm -hmm. The prime minister was exceptionally eloquent. I read it in the Telegraph this morning about the nurse from New Zealand, and I believe the nurse from Portugal as well, who he literally said kept him alive. Give us an update on what you see at Johns Hopkins among the staff, the nurses and all the others assisting the doctors. Well, it's an incredible uh, dedication um, at, at John Hopkins and, and elsewhere. They really, people, you know, have felt um, that this is their calling, this is a responsibility. The, the medical center has been uh, very supportive in terms of making sure there's protective equipment and all kinds of other mental health resources for staff. Um, but, you know, this is, and it, it's not just the doctors and the nurses. There's a real sense of purpose, really, for, for everybody who's working there. And I think, you know, this is a moment in a way that many people have been training for, even if they didn't realize it at the time. Mm. One final question, doctor, if I could. The great fear that's out there is things here in New York, and particularly in the borough of Queens, have been really, really quite horrific. What's the ability of this virus to spread to secondary cities and tertiary locations across the nation? Well, what's really remarkable to me is how so many people believe that what'll ha what's happening there, meaning somewhere else, isn't going to happen here, meaning where I live. And um, nobody should really have that sense of confidence. You know, people felt like, well, it's in China, it couldn't come to Italy, it's in Italy, it couldn't come to the U.S., but, you know, it could go anywhere. Any city could be affected. Um, letting our guard down here, it would be a terrible mistake. And uh, I think that, um, you know, certainly in Baltimore and Washington and other cities, we're seeing increases in cases, and they realize how much is at stake here. And I think, um, you know, we're going to be uh, obviously in touch with people in New York and learning a lot from New York's experience. And uh, the cities that mm. think that they couldn't have this problem are really risking quite a lot. Right. That was Dr. Joshua Sharfstein of Johns Hopkins talking with our colleague Tom Keen. And now we want to get a market check, and for that we go to Kaylee Lyons. Last time I checked, Car Kaylee, we were having a tough day in equities. Where are we? We are having a tough days in equities. That's right, David. Right now, the S&P 500 is down about 1.8% for the Dow. We're down about a full 2%. It's not as much pain for the NASDAQ. It's only down about three quarters of a percent right now. But in some ways, it's not all too surprising that we are lower on the day, given the fact that we're coming off the best week for equities since 1974. There may be 
uh, a little bit of selling off the back of that really incredible rally. And of course, this is just a day before earnings season really kicks off with J.P. Morgan results due before the bell tomorrow. It's going to be a very unknown earnings season. Companies haven't been able to give really accurate guidance. We're kind of going into it blind, and so investors may be pulling off some risk positions ahead of that. Now, when you look beneath the surface of the equity market at the IMAP function on the S&P 500, for example, it's really a broad-based sell-off. Every single sector is lower. The worst performing sector is actually real estate and financials. They're down around 4% each. At top, you have consumer discretionary. It's only down fractionally. And energy, interestingly, is the second uh, best performer, relatively speaking, in the equity market. And that, of course, is due to the fact that you are seeing oil rallying today. WTI is up about 2%. We're trading right around $23 a barrel. And, of course, that is coming off of that historic OPEC plus output cut deal. And of course, we had the president weighing in on that earlier today, saying that actually OPEC Plus is looking to cut more like 20 million barrels a day. So that is feeding through to some optimism in the oil market, David. Okay. Thank you so much to Kaylee Lyons for that market check. Now in the second hour of Balance of Power over on radio, we're going to talk to the first person appointed to that congressional committee to oversight and see all that money going to banks for bailouts. So, so I'm sorry, to companies for bailouts. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV.